right, the most high be praised. Yes. This time we want to prepare ourselves for our class. And if there's anyone else <clears throat> that uh, is planning to come and to be a part of the teaching, maybe someone might want to go and uh, let the others know. I'll give a moment. <clears throat> We're getting ready. For those who are joining us by live stream, I want to say shalom to you and welcome. Uh, this is School of Messiah Bible Institute. We want to welcome you as you come and join us today. Today we are entering into a new course. The course that we're going to be going into is called the transmission of the scriptures the transmission of the scriptures so while others are coming and getting themselves uh, prepared I do want to make mention <clears throat> to those who may be joining us by live stream that you want to enroll in School of Messiah, you can go to our website at www.ncmmi.20m.com and you can uh, click on the link called School of Messiah Bible Institute and at that particular uh, website you can download an enrollment application. Today we are looking at the subject called the transmission of the scriptures. started. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Abinu Mokenu, we bless you today for this time. We thank you for each one present and we ask for your wisdom. We ask for your guidance. We ask that your Ruach would assist in the giving of the instruction. We ask, Father, that each student assembled may have an open heart, an open mind, and a receptive spirit to be able to receive truth. Father, we look to you and thank you for the opportunity that we have to perform the commandment of our Messiah, to teach, to observe all things you have commanded. Now, order the uh, class today, <clears throat> and we trust in your wisdom that everything that is done will bring glory to your great name. In the mighty name of Yahushua, amen. So I want to welcome each one of you today. I want to give some information with regard to this course so that we might understand the basis around the necessity for it. When we talk about the idea of the transmission of the scriptures, we're dealing with the concept of the scriptures being passed down to us. And this is a very important um, course for us who look to the scriptures 
as being our source of divine guidance, there are many Bibles that uh, are in the world and that are at the disposal of many who call themselves followers of the Most High in the Messiah. However, in order for us to really be able to appreciate the scriptures and to be able to also look for uh, proper translations of the transmitted scriptures, it's important that we know how these scriptures came to us, what took place throughout history. We need to examine whether there were changes made during the process of the transmission and translation of scriptures. And so, in order for us to arrive at this <clears throat> information, we've got to go back and we've got to look at its origins. For most of us who live in the Western world, we are accustomed to a Bible that has 66 books. The Bible and the books that they have regarded as being canonical. Many more books than just the 66. And so, in this particular course that I present on the transmission of the scriptures, it's probably going to be a little different than other traditional theological courses on the transmission of scripture. Because it is our intent to introduce all of the writings that have been kept and that have been preserved so as to bring forth the message of Elohim in its entirety. So, the term transmission, I want to read to you, it describes the ancient process of copying both the Hebrew and the Aramaic and Greek manuscripts to preserve them for future generations and to distribute them for greater use. Now, we know that in the ancient time, they didn't have copy machines like we do today, right? They didn't have that technology. So the manner in which they were able to transmit the scriptures is that they had to do it by hand. And another thing that we need to know is that materials that scriptures were written on could only last for a certain amount of time. You know, materials don't last forever, right? You all know that, right? Mm -hmm. After about a good hundred years or more, depending on the type of material it is and what was used, it begins to wear out, crumble. And as a result of that, it calls for a copying of that document in order for the message to be preserved to the next generation. That makes sense to everybody. Mm -hmm. And what that tells us is, is that there are no 
original <coughs> autographs of the writings of the scriptures. Someone might say, what? No original autographs? We don't have the originals? No. The originals cannot survive thousands of years and still be intact. Mm -hmm. Now we know that some have been preserved, but in the ancient time, they had to copy and copy and copy and copy. Now what we have <clears throat> found based upon archeological discoveries have been something that has preserved writings, but those particular findings have had to be handled with great delicacy. It's not like you can pick it up and just, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna read this today, you know, because the whole parchment might fall apart. You understand? So, what we have to understand about the transmission of scriptures is that over time, copies had to be made. Now, <clears throat> the writing materials that were used, first instance that we hear of in the scripture is stone. <clears throat> in Exodus, Shemot, chapter 24, verse 12, we see stone being mentioned. I'm just going to read this and I want to also note a couple of other passages. And in the 12th verse, <coughs> excuse me, in the 12th verse of the 24th chapter, and Yahuwah said, unto Moshe, come up to me into the mount and be there and I will give you sapphire stones and a Torah and commandments which I have written that you may teach them. So here we have where the Most High speaks to Moses and he tells Moshe to come up and he's going to give him stones the particular type of stones was that of a sapphire stone that's the type of stone based upon the language of the text so we see that stone is one of the materials in this instance. And of course, this must have been some type of a divine stone because Moses, Moses received it from the Most High. Also in uh, Devarim 5.22, it notes stone as being a material used. Also in Yahshua, Yahushua, chapter 8, verses 31 through 32, we also find the same thing they mentioned. In verse 32 of chapter 8 of Joshua, it says, And he wrote there upon the stones a copy of the Torah of Moshe. And so we know that stones was one of the materials used. Also, another material that was used for writing scripture is papyrus. Papyrus. I don't know if you heard of papyrus. Mm -hmm. We get the we get the uh, word paper from papyrus. But papyrus is made by pressing and gluing two layers of split papyrus reeds to form a sheet. And so this is also something that was used for writing scripture on. We find that noted in 2 John 12. When it refers to paper, that's papyrus. Also in Revelation chapter 5, 1, the scripture talks about the scroll. That's also referred to as the papyrus. 
Also, animal skins were used as well as another material for the writing down of scripture. Animal skins is what you would call vellum. If you ever heard of the term vellum, vellum at that time was made from animal skins, from either calf or animal parchment. <clears throat> and 2 Timothy 4.13 mentions parchment. And so we have these three main materials used as noted in the scripture as being materials for writing the scriptures on. Also, we want to know <clears throat> to inscribe on these materials, a variety of tools were used. Some of those are a stylus, chisel, pen, and ink. These were the things that were used back in the ancient times for the purpose of writing and copying. Now, the copying process of the scriptures began with Moses. And what's important for us to know is that when Moshe was writing the uh, copies, because the Most High told Moshe after he was given the commandments and statutes and the judgments, the Most High told Moshe, you need to now write all of this in a book. And so Moshe wrote it all down in a book. He gave a copy of it to the leaders. And he also took a copy of it and put it on the side of the Ark of the Covenant. Everybody catch that? So, the Ark of the Covenant already had contained within it the original stones that the Most High had given to him of the commandments. But all of the statutes, judgments, commandments, all of the details were written in a book. And so Moses was the first to begin the copying process so that they could be distributed. The leaders need to have them so that they can know the Torah and teach the people. The one that was on the side of the altar was placed there because the Most High said it will serve as a witness against you. After Moses left the scene, and we've already read here in Joshua 8, 32, that Joshua does the same thing. He now writes the Torah. Let's, let's look again at Joshua 8, 32. Everybody there? We already read it, but I want to I want to go over it again because I want us to see how the continued process of the copying went from one generation to the next. In verse 32 it says, and he, this is referring to Joshua, and he wrote there upon the stones a copy of the Torah of Moshe. You see that? So we see that while Moses, Moshe, had written a copy. After Moshe's departure, Joshua also writes a copy. So the process continued from generation to generation within Israel. Now, the copies were primarily kept in the temple. 
this was the place where they kept it so that they could ensure the preservation of it. Um, because the leaders were the ones responsible for the teaching of the Torah. However, over time, as the house of Israel began to expand in the land, and Israel went through the time of the Shoftim, which was the period of the judges, where they were governed by judges to oversee them. Coming into the period of the kings, <coughs> after the kingdom was divided, there was a time where the book of Torah was lost. And during the time of the book of Torah being lost, mm -hmm. I'm sure you have an idea of what came of the spiritual condition of Israel. It was one of spiritual decadence, mm -hmm. backslide. Mm -hmm pagan worship. Under the reign of King Josiah, Yoshiyahu, over in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 8, through chapter 23, verse 3. I'm not going to read all of that, but you can um, read that whole section when you get time, but that particular section of scripture records the finding of the book of Torah by Hilkiah, the priest, and after the book of Torah was rediscovered, there were reforms that were put in place. <laughs> so we find here that the Torah was in Israel, then lost, and then found. Mm -hmm. And as time went on, because <laughs> Israel continued in its backsliding and rebellion towards the Almighty, the Most High called the nation of Assyria to come and to capture the northern king and to remove them from the land. Now in removing the ten tribes from the land, Assyria transplanted other foreign people and brought them into the land of Israel. Now when they brought them into the land of Israel, there was a small number of Israelites that were still remaining in the land of Israel. And the foreigners intermarried with those Israelites that were still in the land. And they became known as the Samaritans. How many are familiar with the Samaritans? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm giving us a little history with regard to the transmission of the scriptures. And, and, and the reason why I'm, I'm dealing now with the development of the Samaritans is because it's important for us to understand how the Torah in its ancient form was preserved. This is, this is very important. Now, when those transplanted people came into the land because they did not 
follow the Torah. Wild beasts came from all over the land and they were killing the people. And so people were trying to figure out what do we do? We're in this land, but we're being killed by wild animals. And what they were told is that the Elohim of this land requires that those who live in this land must follow the Torah. That's the reason why the ten tribes of Israel were removed from the land because they were not keeping the Torah. So they were removed from the land. The Most High said that the land will spit you out if you don't keep it. All right? So, in order to provide a solution for these new people that were in the land, they called for Kohanim to come and to teach them the Torah. So, when these Kohanim priests came into the land to teach them the Torah, they were given the Torah. So, what we have here now is the Torah among these new people who became the Samaritans. Now, <clears throat> the Torah scroll of these Samaritans is very, very significant. Not much is said about the Torah scroll among the Samaritans. And one of the reasons why very little is said about the Torah scroll among the Samaritans is because the Judean Israelite community of ancient <coughs> times me. having a strong beef with them did not want to focus any attention upon what the Samaritans were doing or with what the Samaritans had. But the Torah scroll of the Samaritans use an alphabet that is very different from the one used in the Jewish or what is called the Jewish Torah scrolls. According to the Samaritans themselves and also Hebrew scholars that are familiar with the ancient Paleo or Old Hebrew, the alphabet is called the Paleo Hebrew alphabet. Both the Samaritans and Hebrew scholars when they look at the Samaritan Torah scroll, testify that the Samaritan Torah scroll is written in the Paleo Hebrew. Now, I want to read some things here that as far back as 1691, this connection between the Samaritan and the Old Hebrew alphabets was made by Henry Dodwell. Quote, the Samaritans still preserve the Pentateuch in the old Hebrew characters. Another scholar, Humphrey Prido, also writes in 1799, quote, and these five books of the Samaritans still have among them written in the old Hebrew or Phoenician character 
which was in use among them before the Babylonian captivity, and in which both these and all other scriptures were written, till Ezra transcribed them into that of the Chaldeans Aramaic. Another statement I want to note, in 1831, edition of the Encyclopedia Americana, quote, during the Babylonish captivity, they received from the Chaldees the square character in common use, and in the time of Ezra, the old Hebrew manuscripts were copied in Chaldee Aramaic characters. So the point that we want to establish in looking at the significance of the Samaritan Torah scroll has to do with the fact that the Samaritan Torah scroll preserves the ancient old Paleo-Hebrew language. Now, <clears throat> after Babylonian captivity, what I want to do, I'm going to, I'm going to shift for a moment. I'm going to shift for a moment because I need to um, build up to Ezra and I want to give further detail about how the scriptures in the modern Hebrew language or what I would call the Aramaic form of Hebrew. I want to talk about how that developed. Now, from the quotations that I read, we got a peek into the fact that Ezra wrote them. But when we go to the Babylonian captivity, the Babylonian captivity took place with the Babylonians coming into the southern kingdom of Yehuda. And we already talked about the ten tribes in the north. And what happened with regard to that transplanting of the people, mixing in with those Israelites that were still in the northern kingdom, and that produced the Samaritans. That's the first captivity in the north. But there was a second captivity in the south that occurred around 120 something years after that first captivity. That second captivity among the southern kingdom by the Babylonians, when they took them into exile, the southern kingdom of Yehuda was not scattered abroad. They all remained in Babylon. And there was a promise given that after 70 years, they would return back to the land. While being in Babylonian captivity, they, by default, took the language of the Babylonians, which was Aramaic. Scripture calls it Chaldean. But they adopted another language. Now, the Aramaic or Chaldean language was similar to Hebrew. It is a Semitic language. So it wasn't as if the people were learning a whole new language, like Greek. All right? They were still among Semitic-speaking peoples. So they understood each other. It would be more along the lines of a dialect uh, change. But <clears throat> while being in Babylon, they now used a lettering script that was in a block form. Okay, everybody understand that? So this captivity 
affected the southern kingdom because it took away their original Paleo-Hebrew foundation. Everybody see that? This is what happened. So when they came out of Babylonian captivity and came back to the land of Israel, Paleo-Hebrew was not in common use among them. Okay? They were now using Aramaic block script. I call it Aramaic lettering system Hebrew phonetics. Does that make sense? It's where you take this lettering system, but you are applying Hebrew phonetics to it. So <clears throat> when Ezra came along and he was reviving and restoring and rebuilding the, the faith and worship in Israel as the temple was being rebuilt, Ezra was the one responsible for the collecting of all of the books and also the writing of the Torah. Now, there are a number of views that has to do with Ezra rewriting the Torah. One is that there were Hebrew manuscripts that were among the Israelites that were in Babylonian captivity and that he transcribed them into the Aramaic language. There's another perspective that Ezra got a copy from the Samaritans and transcribed that into the Aramaic. And that particular view is based upon the idea that when the Babylonians went into Jerusalem and destroyed Jerusalem, that when they burned up everything, they also burned up all of the libraries. So the question is, were there books available from the temple, seeing that the temple was the place where they stored the Torah? seeing that they burned up all the libraries. So that's, that's another view. And then the other view is that the Most High spoke to Ezra and gave him the Torah by divine inspiration. Those are the three different views. You choose which one you want to embrace or believe. Um, but at any rate, when Ezra wrote the Torah, he transcribed it in the Aramaic language. And so <clears throat> after he did that, he also wrote what we know as the books of Chronicles. How many of you are familiar with, with Chronicles? That's Ezra. And Chronicles is Ezra retelling the history. All right? So Ezra was a very, very important figure in Israel in the preservation of the scriptures and in giving the scriptures to Israel. He is regarded <clears throat> as Ezra the scribe. How many of you ever heard of Ezra being called the scribe? He is called Ezra the scribe. And he is that because of the great role that he played in preserving the scriptures, gathering the books together, and then reading the Torah to the people.
Now, <clears throat> at the stage in which Ezra had came upon the scene, this marked a new chapter in the life of Israel. And I'm referring to in particular the southern kingdom coming back into the land. The reason why I say it marked a new chapter is because you have these people coming out of Babylon. They're Israelites, but in many instances, they think like Babylonians. And, 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 the, and, the, and the reason why I say that they think like Babylonians is because at this particular time, when they came back and they restructured the calendar they attributed Babylonian names of months to the calendar where there were names such as for the first month of the biblical Hebrew calendar the most high called it Abi when they came out of Babylonian captivity they changed the name of the first month to Nisan how many of y'all heard of Nisan? <laughs> right? If you, if you look at a Jewish calendar, you will see the month Nisan. Because the Jews who came out of Babylonian captivity carried with them the culture of Babylon with them. So, when Ezra came and they began to move forward, it was different. And so, when we talk about Hebrew, most of the time when we hear the term Hebrew and we see this block script Hebrew, for those who are not familiar with the history and the ancient Hebrew language in which scripture was originally written in, we we think that real Hebrew is that block script when it's not. It's Aramaic. <clears throat> now, for people coming out, having another language, another way of seeing things, it had an impact. And of course, slavery always have an impact upon people, right? Slavery always has an impact upon people. Not always a positive one. <laughs> um, and, and, this, and this is what happened with our ancient ancestors who were, who were in um, the land of Israel that came out of Babylonian captivity. And, and I'm sharing all of this <clears throat> um, as detailed as, as it may be to, to help us see the reality of what was existing during that time. Now, as it pertains to the transmission of scripture, Ezra was pivotal. He was the preserver. And he is noted very highly. Matter of fact, those who are practitioners of rabbinic Judaism look to Ezra we always refer to Ezra and the Great Assembly. Ezra and the Great Assembly. Ezra and the Great Assembly. Because he was the one who collected the books together at that time so that Israel might have scripture. If it wasn't for him, Israel wouldn't have the scriptures. Well, let me not say that. If it wasn't for the Most High, because the Most High is the one who orchestrates all things and he raises up individuals yeah. so that they might preserve his word. So let me, let me correct that. Yeah. But he was the one that was pivotal in helping to bring about the preservation. Now, <clears throat> I want to say a couple things and I'm going to wrap this up. Um, That body of work that Ezra was responsible for putting together 
laid the foundation for Israel to get on the right path. And after those books were put together, there were many other books written. Now, <clears throat> for the most part, we have been told that from Genesis to Malachi are the only books that were preserved and compiled during the time of Ezra. That's the idea. That's the thinking. But there were many other books. The book of Hanak is a book that our ancestors had. The book of Yasher is a book that our ancestors had. The book of the 12 patriarchs are books that our ancestors had. There were more books than just Genesis through Malachi. Now one might say, how do you know that, overseer? Well, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but I will say this and then I will come back to it in uh, another teaching. How many are familiar with the Dead Sea Scrolls? Okay. Now, just to make a point, the Dead Sea Scrolls contains information on many, many books that are not a part of those books that are commonly regarded as the canonized books of the Hebrew Scriptures. Did you know that? There were many books. And matter of fact, the concept of canonization, I mean, y'all heard the concept of canonization. The concept of canonization didn't exist as it exists today, or shall I say, as it did after the coming of our Mashiach. Our ancestors <coughs> primarily took the books <coughs> and received the books. There was no canonization process. The whole idea of a canonization process such as, such as has been noted by church fathers and councils and all of that is not something that existed during the time of Ezra. The books that they had, they received, and they wrote, and they continue to write. And uh, I'm not going to go into everything about canonization, but I just wanted to point out that during the time when Ezra was pulling the books together, there were more books than just what we have been told were brought together. All right? Any questions? Uh, I have one question. Um, so I understand what Aramaic is like. Is that a name of a person or a man, or where did the name of the, that language come from? Is that a people? Okay. Aramaic, Aramaic comes from Aram. Now, in the ancient times, names of lands were, were named after men in ancient times. Okay. Now, the language of the Chaldean people, the Babylonian people, all right, the scripture calls it Chaldean. Aramaic is another term for Chaldean. The scripture calls it Chaldean. So it's just, it's just a term that refers to the same language. For example, Paleo-Hebrew is also called Phoenician. And the reason why is because in the ancient time, the language script or the letter script that is called Phoenician was used by all of those peoples in the land of Canaan. 
So in, in some instances, it's called the Canaanite language because back in the ancient time, they all spoke the same language. You all know that they all spoke the same language at one point in time, right? The Most High divided the languages, right? You, you all know that. Yes. Okay. But the most ancient script is regarded as the Phoenician, which is Paleo. Okay. So when we talk about Aramaic, it's just another word that refers to the language of the Chaldean people. That's all. All right. All right. All right. No other questions? Let us have a word of prayer. Father, we do bless you right now for this time of being able to share this information regarding the transmission of Scripture. We pray, Father, that as we begin to learn how the Scriptures came to us, that you would help us to see the significance and the importance of the scriptures as we build and so that we may be able to hold on to the integrity of the scriptures which is our firm foundation father we bless you and we thank you may the information that has been shared be received and may it help your people to become more anchored in the word that they trust. In Messiah Yahshua's name, we do thank you. Amen. Amen. For those of you who joined us by live stream, we want to say thank you for your participation. We trust that you have learned something about this portion of this course regarding the transmission of scripture and that it will help you to understand the integrity of your Bible and also to be able to appreciate the scripture and how it has been preserved so that it can be trustworthy. If the Most High has touched you to be able to share with this ministry, we ask that you would provide a donation. You can Go to our website at www.ncmmi.20m.com and you can click on the donate button. Also, you can share by cash app. Our cash app code is dollar sign NCMMI. All donations that are received are primarily used to be able to provide resources for biblical studies to help those who are unable to obtain the biblical resources on their own. And so whatever donations the Most High may touch your heart to share with us is greatly appreciated. Well, the Most High be praised. Shalom to you and your families. Shalom. Shalom. Shalom.